Uh, good evening. Welcome. This is uh, to this Investors for Sustainable Cocoa session of the World Cocoa Foundation Partnership Meeting. I am delighted to join you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Acknowledging the land I'm speaking to you from is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishabeg, the Shipuwea, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. I am Ruthann Bartello. I'm an Associate Director of Client Relations at Sustainalytics, and I serve as the Global Lead for Commercialization of Sustainalytics Stewardship Services, working closely with investors to integrate stewardship into their ESG policies and strategy implementation. Sustainalytics is a Morningstar company and a leading independent ESG and corporate governance research ratings and analytics firm that supports investors around the world with the development and implementation of responsible investment strategies. We also work with hundreds of the world's leading asset managers and pension funds who incorporate ESG and corporate governance information and assessments into their investment process. Before turning this session over to our esteemed panel for what I am sure is, to, is going to be an insightful and robust discussion, I would like to take the next 10 minutes or so to share some key trends and insights emerging globally regarding ESG and more specifically how and why investors are embracing responsible ownership as a key component of their ESG strategy. Looking at the global market and how it has developed over the last decade, it has seen tremendous growth. Having started in responsible investing myself in 2010, I have witnessed firsthand the evolution of responsible investing from a niche strategy, celebrating when the Canadian market alone surpassed 1 trillion in assets under management somewhere around mid-decade, to now how it plays a significant role in investment analysis and decision-making processes for more than one third of the world's assets under management. Opening financial media over the last two years, headlines and bylines have reported on the burgeoning ESG investment trend. Inflows to responsible investment strategies increased at an increasing rate through much of 20, 2020 and 2021, even though there were pandemic years. And globally, the evidence shows a healthy growth rate leading up to 2020 as well. As of 2020, looking at the 100 trillion US dollar market globally, 35 trillion of those assets were in sustainable investments. So just to give you some, some um, context there, what we mean is, is that you know, there's the, we're looking at sustainable investing, uh, both from an underwriting or bond market, as well as where we're seeing investors implement environmental, social, and governance practices into their investment making decision process or investment decision making processes. So what we see here is, is that um, that that growth has continued over time, and the portion of those assets have been on a continual increase from 2016 through 2020. And looking forward, projections are looking at uh, the AUM for or ESG strategies or responsible investing to grow to 53 trillion on a global basis and holding steady at more than thir one third of the projected assets under management. At the same time, we see investors are refining and deepening their strategies and investment approaches and, and looking at their methodologies and how that's being approached. And, and we'll talk a little bit about what that looks like in, in some of the developing regulatory uh, pieces later on in our conversation today. But switching gears a little bit and, and looking at how are investors implementing uh, environmental, social, and governance factors into their, their decision-making process. How are they executing those strategies and, and putting them forward to their uh, respective beneficiaries and investors? There are a number of ways that they're looking at it. And their investment, um, sorry, they're, here we're looking at what they are and how they are applying them. So all the way from impact investing, which really looks at uh, investments that are out setting out to achieve a positive social and environmental impact 
They require measuring and reporting on these impacts and demonstrating the intentionality of investor and underlying asset or investee um, and demonstrating the investor uh, contribution. When we look at community investing, it's a little bit different. It's where capital is specifically directed to traditionally underserved individuals or communities. Uh, they're looking at financing small businesses, uh, often related to, to women really looking to, to move themselves and their families forward. It, it, can, it can sound like um, supporting a, a, a woman in Tanzania to buy a fridge uh, to, to keep prawns fresh when the tide goes out uh, once a month, and then being able to rent that fridge space out and earn an ongoing income. That's what community investing can look like. Um, talking about sustainability themed uh, or thematic investing is really looking at investing in sectors that are contributing to sustainable solutions. So solar, um, wind, sustainable agriculture, green buildings, those are the types of things that you could see come there. Moving down the list, you know, looking at best in class or positive screening, what that looks like is investing in, in companies or sectors that are looking to have positive ESG performance relative to their industry peers and to achieve a rating above a set threshold. So investors can set that threshold and then seek out through, through research and data and insights uh, those companies that, and areas that they want to invest in. Negative or exclusionary screening is probably one that most um, have heard of in the past if they've heard of ESG. It has been the more uh, long-term or traditional form of ESG where it really looks to screen out or avoid investing in specific companies, sectors, those that um, they will set a criteria that could look like excluding weapons or tobacco or a company based on company practices, animal testing or violations of human rights. And so that will be a very exclusionary and just not invest in those specific companies or sectors uh, that are doing business in those areas. Looking at norms-based screening it really looks at um, scanning uh, an investor portfolio and understanding where there are companies within that portfolio that could be in violation of international norms and standards. And that can be uh, those uh, issued by the UN Global Compact, the ILO, the OECD guidelines or NGOs. So really looking to find those companies that are in violation and then um, often will exclude those, those companies from their portfolios. ESG integration uh, has over the last decade especially become one of the key ways that investors are implementing uh, ESG into their investment decision-making process. And what ESG integration looks at is a systemic, uh, systematic and explicit inclusion of uh, environmental, social, and governance factors into their financial analysis process. So really including those in the more traditional form of investment analysis and including that across the, the decision-making process and the portfolio management process. Coming back around to corporate engagement and shareholder action, it really looks like uh, shareholders empowering um, or employing their power to influence corporate behavior, the, the opportunity to have direct and, um, and constructive dialogue with the companies that they hold in their portfolio, being able to, to look at maybe where there's a violation of a norm or standard or where um, there's a potential violation of a norm or standard. And really, instead of excluding the company, being able to sit down at the table and talk about what they're seeing across other companies in their portfolio that may be comparable or, or, or coming up against similar challenges and being able to, to present um, you know, best practices, being able to present or encourage um, disclosure and good disclosure around some of these issues in order not only to just take what's happened in the past, past and include it into their investment decision-making process, but understanding where companies are, where, the, where their investee companies are, and how are they moving forward? What are they doing uh, to address some of these concerns that are, are, are on their investor uh, tables? So 
<clears throat> moving on from there, I do want to talk about what's driving the market. So those are the ways that investors are implementing these strategies. But what really what is what keeps it moving forward? What are some of the areas where you know we understand that investors are are really um, not only receiving uh, doing it of their own volition necessarily because there is a lot of um, of implicit reason for doing this, but there's also external factors that come into play. And so wanted to touch on a few of those. And, and you know, if we if we look anywhere, we're seeing regulatory developments. We know that the EU action plan and SFDR has global reach. Uh, it, it is impacting both uh, investors in the in the US. Uh, as well as those within within the European market, and so it is not a local a local regulation that's only impacting those in the EU. It really re reaches beyond that. We've got you know we were seeing and expecting U.S. developments in the ESG space as well as on climate, and and we're waiting to see what happens from the SEC. We know that there's um, there is a move towards human rights due diligence and, and investors being able to assess and understand the companies in their portfolio and how that happens. We're also seeing the development of local stewardship codes. And so, you know, the UK stewardship code, the, sorry about that, the Japan stewardship code, the Australian stewardship code on modern slavery and, and another, a number others of, um, of the like. And so we see, we see it happening from a regulatory perspective. We see it happening from local uh, stewardship codes. And then we also see emerging frameworks such as the CFA Institute for ESG disclosure, uh, which was, was launched recently at COP26. We know that the PRI is really looking um, to, to align and, and report on and, and have investors report on those. TN, TCFD is looking uh, towards, towards that TNFD and, and a number, and, they, and the list goes on and on in terms of, of what we're seeing come to investors and managers of assets to report on and understand the ESG characteristics and ongoings of their investee companies. So from that perspective, you know, the, the regulatory demand or the external demand um, is increasing. And then from an asset manager perspective, you're also managing those assets on behalf of asset owners. And the asset owners have increasing demands on them, both from these regulations, but also from their uh, key beneficiaries and stakeholders. And so the 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 influence is coming from many different directions for uh, ESG to be an implementation. And, and then there's also this part of this regulation and these developments is the demonstration of responsible ownership. And that's where we see uh, investors wanting to speak to, to their investee companies and having those constructive dialogues and, and being able to, to really drive that their influence and the agendas forward when it comes to ESG. On the other side, investors do face a number of challenges in those areas and, and they you know, alike are looking for support from, from others and, and from you know, collaborative uh, initiatives and, and ways that they can come together and, and address these issues uh, more from a investor perspective as opposed to individually. So where does it come, where does it come down to it? And, and it really is, you know, not just one-sided. And, and that's, I think, where I'd, I'd like to conclude my time and turn it over to, to our panel is engagement creates value, not just for investors. They don't just get the insights and understanding as to how their investee companies are operating and, and really learn what the long-term view and, and progress is on specific uh, ESG concerns or opportunities. Uh, within their investee companies, but it also gives companies on the other side a real understanding of what is important to their investors. What are, are some of the key concerns that they have? How are they, how are they looking to manage them? What, what are they actually looking for? So being able to get a good understanding from the investing public as to what is your expectation around this disclosure or this policy or this practice. 
uh, really being able to go back and forth and share information, transfer knowledge. Again, investors are often talking to many different companies in the same industry or in different industries and being able to have that, that connected conversation and share best practices across is, is something that is quite valuable for uh, companies alike. And then finally, I would include that the, the stakeholder benefit is it really drives uh, the loyalty of, of your long-term uh, investors and those that are holding your, your company for a very long time and have a view to hold for a very long time. So with that, I hope I've been able to, to provide some insights as to where we've come, uh, where we are and where we're going, and some of the reasons why you might be hearing from those investor companies that are holding your, holding your stocks and other uh, financial assets and why they want to talk to you about some of these key issues. John, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Next. I'm not muted anymore, I hope. I might know. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. And that was a brilliant start. And thank you to Sustainalytics slash Morningstar for all the brilliant work that you're you're doing. I've I've had the pleasure to work with you for a very, very long time over the years and much appreciated for, for all the help you're doing to us institutional investors. And thank you everyone for joining us this morning or evening or wherever you are. It's been a it's been a very grey November day here in Stockholm, I can tell you that much. So uh, I've had another coffee now to stay awake. We have a brilliant panel with us today. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I'm going to introduce myself very briefly and then I'm going to let everyone on, on the panel introduce themselves. Uh, I'm going to be moderating this panel, but I'm that kind of moderator that sort of I can't really just moderate, so I'll probably have opinions about everything because I'm a, I have a lot of opinions. That's my job when you're Secretary, Secretary General of the Council on Ethics. But I also want everyone in the crowd who's listening in to send in questions to, to the chat box, and I'll try to pick them up uh, when we go when we get going. And and to to the people participating in the panel, please chip in uh, to and comment what other people are saying, so we get a lively discussion. I. I, I, I dislike, I'm not going to use the word hate, I dislike it when, when we sort of just do our segments and there are no dynamics in it. And I know we have dynamic people on this call. So my name is John Houchin. I run the Council on Ethics with Swedish National Pension Funds. We're asset owners, as, as Ruth Ann described. Um, and we have about $280 billion under management collectively. So we're not very big, but we're rather big. Um, We've been engaging with companies uh, for about 15 years through the council. So we have quite a lot of experience on engagement. We've been engaging with uh, almost every sector you can imagine <laughs> over these years. There's been issues in every sector. I can tell you there's no company and there's no sector who hasn't got human rights, environmental or corruption issues. So you don't have to worry if you're a company listening in, you know, that's the reality of the world we live in today. Uh, and I think uh, I think that's important to highlight. Uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's not problems we're looking we're looking for solutions. So uh, engagement is important for us. Uh, we're long term. We will be in the market for a very very long time, and uh, we need to solve these issues. Uh, privately, on my personal side, having worked with these issues for about twenty years. I think everyone who's been engaged on these kind of issues sort of end up with child labor, or slave labor as sort of personal issues that you find very important that you want to address in any way you can. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of environmental issues and other human rights issues out there that, that you're keen on. But, but in the end, slave and, and child labor issues sort of gets to your heart and, and to your brain over the long term. And having done the ruggy review of the council five, six years back, our conclusions was quite uh, quickly that we were, uh, our salient human rights risks were going to be slave labor and child labor. And therefore the interest within the cocoa sector uh, has been ongoing for since then, six, seven years back. And we've been working with Stina, who I'm going to introduce at, at the last point with Systematics, but also with a lot of the companies, uh, a couple of them on the call today. and and quite many not on the call today as well. And we all know this is a tricky issue, um, but it's going to be, be great to touch upon it as well. So that's that's my introduction very quickly. And my order that I've got here, and I'm going to let you introduce uh, yourself, 
uh, not for too long, but rather quickly. I'm going to start with Tamara because I've got Tamara first on this. So over to you, Tamara. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Tamara Hardecker. I'm uh, the managing director of the Swiss Association for Responsible Investment, um, called SVVK. Um, uh, very much like uh, John's uh, organizations, we're uh, asset owners. We unite uh, the 11 among the 11 largest pension funds of this country, Switzerland, um, public pension fund, mostly managing roughly 300 uh, billion euro. That's a little bit more in US dollars. Um, our organization is a bit younger. We've been created uh, in end of 2015, so about six years ago, but um, also since um, very early in that period, um, child labor and especially in the cocoa supply chain came up as a, as a key issue. Um, engagement, the, the dialogue with the companies we are invested in is the focus um, of our organizations. We do believe in this dialogue also as long-term uh, pension fund investors. And uh, well, while divestment can be can be an option, I think uh, uh, we all prefer to have a constructive outcome in the end. And um, yes, so uh, that's why we are here today. Um, we've also worked with Sustainalytics in this, and uh, yes, happy to participate in this channel with this great um, other panelists. Excellent. That was that was short, but to the point. Much appreciated, Tamara. And I know your organization well. I I was there when it was started, and I I think it's been brilliant for for the Swiss uh, asset owners to come together in that way. And you've done some really good work. So heads up for that. Now over to one of our Swedish participants, and I'm going to leave it to uh, Rebecca from Alekta to introduce ourselves. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I hope you can hear me all. Uh, so I'm Rebecca and I work as an ESG analyst at Alekta, uh, which is the Swedish pension fund that we have around 100 billion of euros on their assets under management. And we've also been involved in Sustainalytics uh, thematic engagement in, on child labor in cocoa. And in relation to the cocoa industry, we are invested uh, in, for example, Nestle. So, of course, we've been following uh, extra uh, th this company's efforts uh, in relation to this. Uh, and very happy to participate in this panel today. Brilliant. And uh, and Electa is doing some really good work. And I think just for people to make a distinction on investors, because I think for many on this call, uh, investors are one group. But I'm, I'm going to make a distinction. So uh, and why Rebecca mentioned Nestle is because they're, they're a, they've got a stock picking set up which means they, they have less companies in their portfolios and they pick their companies very strategically. Yeah, but I think it's important. And I, and I think Electa has done a really good job on that. And it's actually quite unusual when it comes to large asset owners that you, hold, that you have a, a stock, stock picking procedure. Many institutional investors are, are index based like the AP funds. And we have thousands and thousands of companies in the portfolio, which makes the ownership procedures a bit more complicated. So that was a bit of divergence, but I think it's good for people to see the distinction on that one. So next on my list is going to be Irina. Irina, over to you. And maybe you can give your distinction back because I think you're stock pickers as well. Correct me if I'm wrong. Hi, John. Thank you. Yes, my name is Irina van der Sluis. I uh, am uh, here in my living room uh, in The Hague. Uh, which is in the Netherlands, and I work as a responsible investment specialist at NN Investment Partners. We have some 350 billion euros assets under management, and um, we are very happy to be on this panel today because, I mean, I've looked at some of the sessions also tomorrow, and there's a wealth of, of expertise and knowledge around this important topic, uh, cocoa, child labor, living income, and sometimes it's hard for investors to keep keep up with the with the newest information. So I'm I'm really grateful for the World Cocoa Foundation for uh, for hosting these events, uh, but also for Sustainalytics, like John says, for for helping us sometimes in the engagement. Um, so personally, I have been yeah working on business human rights issues for 15, 20 years now. First with the Dutch uh, government, Ministry of Foreign Affairs when it was all developed, the rugby framework and the UNGPs and everything after that around due diligence. And due diligence is exactly why we also came uh, to the conclusion that uh, obviously, and when you look at the S pillar uh, and, and the thematic engagements, 
that we are focusing on, on child labor as the fundamental ILO uh, right. And let me just remind everyone that the ILO was uh, um, created in 1919, which is over 100 years ago, and we're still talking about a fundamental human right. Anyhow, that's sometimes where, yeah, some of my frustration is, although I do believe wholeheartedly in engagement. And for us, engagement is really embedded in the organization. So I have 900 colleagues. Uh, we have a great team on RI, Responsible Investment, but the 900 colleagues, the portfolio managers, the analysts, they are actually also having ESG dialogue, which is super important, I think, to have that embedded. But again, focusing on the S pillar, it is about a child a labor, but we connect it also with the modern slavery indeed and the living income. And if I have time later, I'll, I'm happy to talk to you a bit more about the platform living wage, living income slash financials. Uh, that is also having talks uh, connected to, to uh, child labor, obviously. Last but not least, just to say um, thank you, Ruth, and also for that comprehensive overview of the financial sector. Indeed, um, financial sector has a role to play. Uh, for us, a key driver is actually our clients. I just wanted to mention that because our biggest one is um, NN a Group, an insurance company here, and they really want us to invest responsibly. So. Uh, we, we gladly take that up and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thanks, John. Excellent, perfect. And that was a very nice introduction as well. So we're gonna turn over to our two great companies who've agreed to join this panel, much appreciated. And I, and I personally, uh, coming from a company, having a corporate background myself, a um, long time back, I, I always think the corporate voice, the people doing the work on the ground is really important on this. And this, there are some challenging topics on this one. So really appreciate your time and the coming to this panel. And I'm going to start with uh, uh, Andrew, according to my list. So over to you, Andrew. Maybe you can do it in French. No, I'm not going to ask you to do it in French again. Uh, good, thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. So my name is Andrew Brooks, uh, head of Cocoa Sustainability at uh, Olam. So as Olam, uh, we're one of the largest cocoa sourcing uh, and processing companies. So we source probably around just over the about 12% of the world's cocoa, uh, ranging in present in uh, nine uh, sourcing uh, origins from Papua New Guinea through to Ecuador. Uh, as well as processing in 12 sites around the world. So uh, very pleased to be on this panel. Obviously, we are running a broad basket of sustainability programs with our branded customers. And as such, obviously, have uh, considerable interest in obviously in discussing the, all the key uh, <clears throat> ESG topics with all our clients and, and customers and uh, key investors. Thank you. Brilliant. And uh, secondly, on, on the corporate side, but not last, we've got Lee as well. Please, Lee, introduce yourself. Oh, thank you, John, and thanks everyone for having me. My name is Lee Horner, and I lead global sustainability for the Hershey Company. Uh, for those who are not aware, we are one of the branded companies. We sell uh, the beloved chocolate uh, products, um, mainly here in the U.S., but also in other markets around the world. Um, and, um, you know, really important panel um, from where I sit. Uh, I oversee all global sustainability. COCO has been and will continue to be our number one topic in the ESG um, landscape, um, has been for 127 years of our existence and probably will be for the next 127 years. Uh, it's a very important sector for us. Um, it's a very important, you know, sector for our consumers and something that you know we really do believe that partnership and you know working together is going to be the only way that we solve uh, some of the issues particularly the ones that we're talking about today um, and you know we'll get into this as part of the panel john but you know having the voice of investors talking with companies and really understanding that dynamic is a critical component of the work that we do uh, it's growing every day and every week um, and so, again, happy to be here and, and happy to be part of the conversation. That's perfectly. I, I think that's an important topic. And, and we will, I, I think we'll drill into the details, what, what we can improve and how we can improve that dialogue and how we to, collectively together can improve this whole discussion. I, I think there's plenty of things to touch upon. So, but much appreciated you participate. And then finally, but not least, 
my colleague from Sustainalytics uh, and our, I would say my right hand on this topic over the last six, seven years that we've been engaging and doing trips together to the Ivory Coast and what have you not. Stina Nielsen, who runs the, the COCO project at, um, at Sustainalytics, I leave it to you and maybe you can put some flavor on that, Stina. Absolutely. Thank you very much, John. So pleasure also to you to be here and, and really good to be in this panel where I sort of this is my my everyday life being sort of in the middle of of companies and, and investors and, and enjoying that very much. Um, so I'm in the stewardship team at Sustainalytics. So where we do this more in-depth dialogues with with companies together with our investor clients um, and i've been focusing for many years on human rights and and many supply chain issues related to that as um, as you can imagine um, and cocoa and child labor has been really one of my um, my key topics um, in in that that broader context so i have been engaging with uh, with the cocoa sector for I think actually a decade now. Um, so with with Andrew and and uh, Lee and and colleagues um, as as well. So I've seen also this quite um, uh, well, quite a lot of developments also when it comes to um, the the issue of child labour, which has been uh, the focus throughout this uh, this time. Uh, from from rather uh, defensive dialogues when we started off um, to really seeing you know how um, how the the, the UN guiding principles, I think, have been sort of the underlying um, structure here of, of seeing how, how companies have um, have taken on the, the responsibility um, role and, and tried to, to get to and tackle um, this, this really quite challenging uh, topic. Um, so not saying that we're, um, we're there, but, uh, but having seen, um, having seen and, and seeing the, the, the matured dialogue um, on, um, on this matter. Um, so also, I should say that some of the investors are here today, but but we have 40 institutional investors uh, that are collaborating with us um, in this thematic engagement, as we call it, on child labor in COCO. Um, so there is really quite a quite a tremendous um, backup from from the investor side, and and really wanting to see see further change um, on this uh, this topic. So I'll. Um, I'll keep it at that um, for uh, for now and leave it back to John. All right. Thank you very much, Stina. And thank you for all the excellent work you've done over the years on this topic. And I totally agree with you. It's We, we, we started off so-so, but it's the discussion these days are, are much improved. And to Lee's point, there's so much dynamic in the whole setup now with so many investors trying to understand what where the responsibilities go, etc. So, But I'm actually going to go to... Irina and and ask her because she she was fired up on human rights and I totally agree with her. I I, I think nine, 1919 and we, we're still talking about the fundamental human rights here. Uh, to my point on child labor and slave labor, for instance. But there's many topics within the cocoa sector, and maybe you would be able to to give me a view on what you are looking at, Irina. Not only slave labor, child labor, but the whole setup. Yes, with pleasure. And, and don't, don't get me wrong. I mean, I think everybody agrees that we have to implement and it's not all uh, on, on the, the investees, for sure not. And let me also reiterate how important the talks uh, that we have with the cocoa companies are also for us to learn. So it's always a two-way street. It's always an exchange. And so, yeah, so let's let, let that be also the, uh, the favor of, of this panel. But um yeah, so as I started to say, we kind of bundled that deep dive on the S around uh, the issues, modern slavery, living income wage and child labor. And uh, Stina and others will talk maybe more in depth around the sustainalytics led engagement, but I'm also happy to share a few words uh, because it's so intertwined um, uh, about the platform living wage financials. And whenever I say living wage, uh, please also think living income, uh, smallholders, uh, Coco. So we uh, set up this platform a few years ago with Dutch investors, and to my own <laughs> surprise, it kind of uh, um, grown into this 18 international investors uh, um, and counting uh, platform that is really homegrown and tailor-made with 4 trillion euros assets under management. 
uh, we have a website livingwage.nl uh, but anyway so it is more tailor-made and meaningful in the sense that uh, we figured well okay if we want to really do a deep dive we might as well do our own assessments of uh, cocoa companies and living income but also garment sector and living wage uh, and also retail so it's it's more sectors uh, but really why you know um deep, deep diving on on living wage and income because uh on the s it's so fundamental and it has the potential to really uh, mitigate uh, other human rights risks at the same time you know if you have a living wage then perhaps maybe less child labor less excessive overtime more space for education and, and less inequality so for us it's an empowering uh, human right uh, key enabling and so we created this methodology a few years ago uh, based on the UNGPs and looking at the reporting framework, C1, C6, if, if, if you're nerdy like me, <laughs> on that uh, reporting framework. Um, and then really asking companies, and some of you absolutely know that because we, we have these talks with you, on do you have a, a living income, living wage policy, and do you really integrate it, do you, do you report about it, whole due diligence cycle. And we've seen so much progress over the last year, so, so really, really interesting. Um, we do this annually, we present results, and just a month ago, uh, John, we presented this uh, here uh, in a hybrid conference, um, and we came to the conclusion that uh, if we zoom into COCO, there has been progress, there is maturity around this, but uh, maybe also a few pointers here that the companies might or might not uh, be able to, to respond to that we see during our assessment uh, cycle this year that we, we, we might want to see a bit more of the living income language in the human rights policy. Uh, also, some, some board level commitment would help uh, us uh, to, to, to progress in the future. Um, also, the pilot projects are really interesting with IDH, with FLA, etc. And they, they really um, have impact on the ground, but they, they seem a little scattered. So we, we were wondering, how can you mainstream it more? And then also start really measuring gaps on, on, on wage uh, levels. Again, there is lots out there, uh, uh, lots of organizations that can help, but not rely too much on certification bodies. So just, John, a few conclusions short on that. Again, because it's so intertwined and because we, yeah, we really think that if we, if we tackle this broader uh, uh, S topic that we might be able to do our part in the whole scheme of where there's the duty to protect uh, from the government side. Thank you. Brilliant, Irina. I, 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 I totally agree. And it's, it's very much been the topic, not only within this sector, but within many sectors uh, for, for the last few years. And, and I think the project you've been running has been, been really, really, really good. Is there any comments on this topic? Anyone who wants to comment from, from the corporate side on this topic right now? Philly, I know, know there's been some really brilliant work done by, by a no number of companies, actually. If anybody wants to pick that up. Yeah, hi. Uh, happy to make a comment. So at Olam, obviously, I think we're one of the first companies or supply chain companies uh, in Coco to make a commitment on living income. So part of our Coco Compass strategy, uh, which we launched in uh, 2019, uh, living income and obviously making sure of developing prosperous farmers is was one of our key commitments, uh, where we decided that we took look at our overall uh, direct supply chain at the time. And we said, obviously, we need to really make a, a mark in the stand and the sand bigger bun. Uh, so we came out with uh, overall some 60% of our farmers at the time, where we said we want to really achieve, aim to achieve a living income for these farmers, which is some representing at the time, so 150,000 farmers. Uh, we would strive to achieve a living income for them by 2030. Uh, we have a, a interim target of 60,000 farmers by 2024. And obviously, we, so we, in the moment we are obviously collecting the benchmarks uh for all across all the countries and which we've now achieved some seven out of the nine working with the two um and collecting all the household incomes to be able to really quantify where we are on the scale um but i think it's for us it's important that we wanted to really make this stand because we think it's obviously we work as olam we work very closely with the farmers we want to really appreciate the relationships we have with them and we see this as a really critical point. Uh, so fully support the, the investor stands here to really push us to push companies to really make this a, a key target. So uh, very much supportive of this, 
of the stance and then on the, the journey that we're all on. And uh, I really appreciate the work that you've been doing as well. And I know a few other companies as well, not on this call, that it's been a lot of focus on this area over the last couple of years. And I think collectively, once again, if, if everyone pulls in the same direction, you can have an impact. And there's also an a, a efficiency and efficiency in, in the things that we do collectively together, which I think is one of the strengths I've seen over the years that the investors can also do is to get that sort of uh, convening power, use the convening power to, to see that we pull in the same direction and maybe, maybe kill a few, kill a few darlings for some companies. So it all sort of becomes a bit more efficient, but great work, Andrew. And thank you very much. Look, I, I, usually I, I was actually going to start with you, Tamara, but, but uh, Irina got off to, to the starting point. Um, every, whenever I go to Switzerland, I apologize to Belgium and a few other countries, but whenever I go to Switzerland, it's always chocolate that sort of comes to mind. And I, unfortunately, Springley, and I know Springley Lint is not on the court, but Springley has always been my favorite, but it's become very expensive. So I, I think I need to, to, to jack up my, my salary to enable, in order to get it. But Looking at Switzerland, what kind of discussion is it more in general, you know, from your stakeholders and people on, on these issues, just looking at the pride you have in Switzerland on chocolate and companies like like we just touched upon. It's, it's a national symbol, isn't it? Indeed. I think uh, what has one of the highest per capita consumptions of chocolate, I believe. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think not only to Switzerland, but to many people, chocolate is a very dear product. And, and I think it's it's one where their sensitivities are higher. But, um, you know, and others have mentioned it. There, or you have mentioned it. There are a lot of other supply chains and other areas we could be looking at. But I believe, you know, um, this is one of the challenges investors have. They are invested in so many companies around the world, in all industries. They have to they have to pick one, and I believe that the, the focus on cocoa can also help us to to create models that work perhaps in other supply chains. Again, now you asked about the public discussions. I believe yes, that's certainly been a, a driver uh, to to. Uh, you know, include ESG as a, a general so sustainability in our fiduciary duty, in our approach more and more. I think that um, it's not just, it's not regulation per se, but the ev evolution maybe of how fiduciary duty is viewed and fiduciary duty meaning as the duty to work, to act in the interest of our insured people, the, the beneficiaries, right? And I think one other side of this coin, the, the relate, very late related concept to that is the universal ownership. And, and coming back to what Irina said, um, living income, you know, I think we need to see the bigger perspective of economic growth, right? And without living income, there cannot be economic growth. But what does a universal investor that is completely diversified in the entire invest in the entire world, what does such an investor want to see is, is economic growth in all regions evenly and an efficient allocation of capital. And I think that in that in that perspective, it must be, it has to be our interest to in, integrate such should such consideration. I mean, just to take a step back, why we are actually here. Um, of course, we are investors and we have to in the end ensure that our beneficiaries can have a rent once they retire. We don't have customers as such, but we have beneficiaries and we have to, one, respect their values too, and to um, ensure that we look at the concept of, of uh, fiduciary duty in a more global sense. So maybe just two cents about the discussion in Switzerland or our perspective on that, which I think is, is more a global one. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I... I Lee, you're the you're the US participant on, on this call and we're getting a very European perspective on, on the call so far. And quite honestly, there for me and I've been in the investment community for 20 years, there's there's been a difference between US uh, investors, European investors. We we have historically engaged in in slightly different manners, I would say. Uh, for different reasons, fiduciary reasons, what have you. There's also been legalistic reasons and a lot of discussions on, on those issues in the US where it's 
Europeans asset owners have maybe had a slightly different view. But you, as you raised in your introduction, there's a lot of focus right now on these issues in the US. Can you give us a flavor, not, not only on the discussion we've had, what the discussion looks like in the US right now for a company like yours? Absolutely. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, our company is traded on the New York Stock Exchange and I've shared this with a couple of people. Um, so apologize for those who may have heard it. Um, I've been in the sustainability space at Hershey for eight to 10 years. And over the last year, I would say we have engaged more with the investment community on topics related to ESG than we did in the t previous 10 years. Um, it is every, probably every week um, that we are talking to investors. So yes, I would say, you know, we talk with both um, US uh, asset managers as well as European asset managers. We're owned, you know, we have um, people who own us outside the US. And, um, you know, while I think European investors may be um, a touch more in depth on particular topics, I would say we tend to have much more Deep, I would say deeper conversations on more specific topics while uh, growing with the US, it's typically a range of topics that they wanna engage with us on. Um, but it, that gap is closing really, really fast. I would say that uh, there's not a lot of sunlight anymore. Um, you know, for a company like ours, we spend a lot of time, of course, talking about cocoa, but we talk a lot, um, and I think globally on climate and the environment. And of course that has significant impacts into the cocoa uh, ecosystem as well. Um, so, um, you know, this is something that we welcome. It's something that we're eager to have conversations about. Uh, we're very proud of the progress that we're making. We, you know, are the first, I'm the first person to say we have a long way to go and a lot to learn. Uh, and those conversations are really helpful in understanding, um, you know, the investment community brings to us on a very regular basis, different points of view that they're hearing from that allows us to continue to look at, okay, our priority set, the KPIs that we're going after, the programs and initiatives that we are focused on um, to make sure that we're always doing that check of, are we really thinking about and anticipating where we need to go? Uh, it just provides a very um, well-rounded view for us. So, um, you know, as I said, I, this discussion is not wildly different than ones I'm having in the US. Um, as I said, it just some from time to time, I find that the European uh, investment community may be a little bit deeper on a couple of topics uh, than maybe some of their Euro Euro U.S. counterparts. Perfect, and thank you very much. And I and I think I mean the investors participating here today, we 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 engage collectively to make it more efficient for you guys. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're quite mindful, I, and I think that's an experience we all have. If you look, for instance, at the principles for responsible investment, when, when we started that, we were about 40 funds 16, 17 years back, and now we're like 5,000 funds signed up to the principles for responsible investment. You can't have 5,000 funds because I, I presume many of them are invested in you in you guys, and you can't have them all calling you all the time wanting a meeting. So we, we try to make it as efficient Pool our pool our resources together and and do this through somebody like Stina in this case, for instance. So um, I, I guess there's something on that, but I, I I totally agree. I I think I think the U.S. side is stepping up quite quickly, and and that's brilliant because they they have a huge impact and they're really an important player as well. So so good good point, Stina. We touched upon your favorite topic uh, and, and the living, living income and living wages. Give us a bit of your view on, on that topic, where we are at now and, and, and what you see as, as the bigger hurdles going forward, please. Yeah, happy to. So, um, so maybe, maybe to take a step backwards and, and just go back maybe three or so years um, back in time. Uh, when uh, when I've been uh, to conferences and and similar meetings as as to this one and and where uh, living income started to be uh, to be raised more and more um, and and where I could see um, companies more sort of listening in seeing where where the discussion was heading um, to I mean where we're at today where uh, I mean we heard from uh, from Olam previously that they've made a, a commitment and um, and and Hershey has a position as well on the topic so. Um, so where 
where they have really stepped in um, and are in the dialogue. So that's that's obviously um, very positive to see. And and I know also, I mean, you have farmer programs on, on the ground um, that are, I mean, looking to improve uh, farmer livelihoods as well. Um, so I think, you know, there, there are several um, several steps uh, forward, um, and um, but but with that said, of course, I mean we we all know that we're not there. Um, so I think you know a few maybe a few a few points. Um, so so I mean I think uh, also the overall uh, theme of uh, of this partnership meeting is collaboration um, and and pointing to to for example initiatives like the IDH uh, roadmap on living income really having companies coming together and and build common practices um, and and actions uh, on this topic i think is is really a key one um and and i mean at at the end of the day i see i see lots of, of promising pilots being there um to to improve farmer livelihoods which is great of course um but but really seeing you know what which ones are actually the effective ones and, and which ones can we can we put to scale so i think you know for for this conference and and for the participants these are uh, no, no new things, but but really something that we're we're looking closely at from the investor side, and and really wanting to see at the end of the day scale and and real impact, of course, um, in in farming communities. Um, and I think also, I mean, what we're looking at. So, I mean, we can have an endless discussion of you know what are the smart mix of uh, of interventions and so on. So I won't go too much into detail uh, on that. But I think um, I think one thing to to point to is is really looking at and, and questioning. You know, are we are we really having the right business models and procurement models here? Um, so looking at at value sharing, different value sharing models. Um, in 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 uh, in supply chains um, and and seeing you know what are the what are the different alternative proposals um, that that um, um, that that are there um, that that we can we can look to um, uh, to follow basically so so maybe I'll yeah I'll I'll keep it at at that for now. Brilliant, thank you, Stina, and and. Um, uh... Having worked closely with you on this topic for a number of years, as we've mentioned before, I know, I know your your heart beats very strongly for this topic in many ways, and you've done some brilliant work getting all, us all focused on on the right thing. So keep it up. I'm going to go over to my Swedish compatriot Rebecca from from Electa, and and, and uh, we we're going to talk about call to action from investors to companies. What is the call to action and, and why? We're going to touch upon that topic. And once again, uh, elect our stock pickers. They're not universal owners. And this is just to the wider audience to distinguish the difference between different investment strategies. I'm over overdoing it a bit, but it could be quite yeah. good. So over <laughs> to you, Rebecca. I, I can just reiterate my, my investor colleagues here in this panel about the importance, of course, with the living income commitment uh, from companies. Uh, we, of course, appreciate that very much. Uh, but one other thing that we have been uh, thinking and looking at quite a lot is actually, um, and I would argue that that is one of the most important things to focus from a company perspective. And that is a clear need for the alignment uh, of uh, actions within the companies. And I think that you, Stina, also mentioned this a bit, especially if you look at uh, the sustainability function versus the procurement function within a company, as they naturally have two different agendas. We can, on the one hand, see the price pressure, uh, but on the other hand, see, of course, the focus on sustainability and labor rights. And I think that one of the biggest challenges is act actually that kind of alignment. Uh, so that is, of course, something that we always raise uh, where, when we have dialogues with companies. Um, so that is one thing. But then, of course, effective partnerships uh, and collaborations between different tier companies, uh, including retailers and suppliers and different brands, etc. Uh, so that is uh, something that uh, us from Alekta would, would like to raise in terms of that. Brilliant. Thank you, Rebecca. And um, I, I think that's um, some really important points raised there. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm actually already now because we're getting quite a few uh, questions from the audience, which 
I personally think it's a sign that they're listening to what we're saying and we've got an engaged audience, which is the key purpose of us being here today. And I'm actually going to wrap two of them into uh, a, a sort of the same because I, I, they've been reoccurring to my mind, at least over the years I've been looking at this. But we can do them, we can do them separately. And maybe I'll just ask everyone on the panel to respond the way they want to. One of them is, uh, is sort of the white label, the white label issue. We seem to be picking up the same brands, the same suppliers in the discussions, but we all know there's there's a lot of white label cocoa through retailing, retailing own brands, etc. How do we get them into the responsibility loop, and how do we secure that they pull their weight? in in these discussions so there's no free riding because obviously we have free riding in all kind of of sector engagements that is that is the realities of things uh i've seen some good examples but uh i'm, I'm going to leave it to the panel to to respond to this one anyone who wants to pick up on that i can, I can give it a try john so um um uh... Well, I think we need legislation, <laughs> really. I mean, there is, you know, wonderful best practices out there. Investors can do so much. Uh, these front runners companies can do so much, but we need a level playing field. So I'm super excited to see what is coming out of the, the uh, Reinders uh, initiative. And, and I think Ru Ruthann mentioned it briefly in the introduction, the mandatory human rights and environmental, by the way, due diligence legislation. Uh, some are a bit skeptic. I'm still open and positive uh, what comes out of that. And it's basically saying what all of you guys have been doing for 10 years is now mandatory uh, in the EU. Um, but there's also questions around that. For instance, a big question that also the organization Shift, I think, is working on is how do regulators then also going to assess the efforts? That's the million dollar question. We don't have to raise it here. But uh, in any case, John, to your Question around white labels, let's have a level playing field that's also uh, a fairer for the companies that are uh, front running. And um, one small other thing I want to raise is, um, and it came also up uh, 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 during a conversation with IDH on the roadmap uh, on, on living income, but it also tackles other um, social and, by the way, environmental uh, issues, um, is the business case. Um, so you could say that white labels will be on board if there is a business case for all this stuff. But sometimes I wonder, do we need to have a business case? Is this something uh, we should take out of the business case and have just like a, a baseline, a ring fence around labor rights? Just a question, thanks. Excellent, thank you, Rina. Anyone else, any points on, on that discussion? I, I presume, and this is just a presumption without knowing the market, I presume Olam supplies to a number of, of different sort of industry labels, you have the number of clients. Do you see a difference between sort of the well-branded? Is there a difference between different? I, I'm just putting it out there, but I, I guess there's a huge difference between different brands. But considering the work that you're doing, you're giving them a a fundamental platform to, to be responsible on, I presume. That's my presumption, at least. Andrew. Certainly. Um, I would say probably one of our earliest partners in our sustainability programs has been a retailer uh international retailer so it's very keen right from the outset to establish uh <clears throat> sustainability programs across well, within coco and obviously a number of products that all the number of products that they're supplying so for us it's really <clears throat> i would say a a good mix of customers be they retail and obviously all the brands particularly um who are very keen on and have been focused on a lot of esg topics for, for, for quite a long time um, but obviously just reiterating um, the comments just recently, obviously we very much support this legislation. We think it's a critical piece to be, <clears throat> to bring everyone into a level playing field. Um, but I think what is critical in this is obviously it needs to have uh, support from the uh, obviously EU with the origin governments to making sure that it's going to be fully effective because we don't, what we don't want to see is obviously it needs what is critical is that basically everyone is involved, not just the uh, international companies, but it needs to have to cover the whole the whole supply chain and what is currently perceived as uh, the indirect supply chain at the moment, uh, where obviously there's a lot of questions raised about that. Um, but that's where this 
holds support from the EU government and needs alignment with the origin governments is critical to be able to bring that and to make sure it is a fully effective level playing field. So we're very much supportive of that and move to that effect. Perfect. Now, I'm actually going to ask Lee a, a strategic issue here now. I, I always find it fascinating. I mean, you're, Hershey is, is such a big public brand in the US and I mean, you're the go-to chocolate in the US when you're in the US. I would say, I mean, having sort of a, a brilliant strategy on these topics and being very strong on the talk, topics we've spoken would, would be sort of a sort of proactive side. Would you even want your competitors from sort of the white labels to, to, to compete with you? I, I mean, how would you perceive this? Do you mind? I mean, they are getting a bit of free riding. I mean, this is usually the way we use you guys as well. When we engage with other companies, we say, you look at the leaders, you, you steal with pride. You don't have to reinvent the, v, the wheel. You, you can take and you can pick up what they're doing. How do you feel? I mean, would you say, do you want this to be a level playing field or do you want to continue just having it as, as a, as a add on to the brand? I think this might be the easiest question I'm going to answer all day, which is we absolutely want everyone participating because it's not about it's not about competing on this, right? This is not a competitive advantage when you think about uh, the, the, the the farmer ecosystem and cocoa and the need for I think Tamara said it the economic development and having you know a really great thriving ecosystem in cocoa. So um, for me you know, having everyone participate and, and, and because, because no one of us can do this alone. We, we cannot and we will not be successful working at it alone. Um, you know, we partner very closely with Andrew's organization. We partner with lots of people because uh, first of all, we know we don't have all the answers. We never will. Uh, we wanna learn from people who are doing things really well. We're happy to share what we're doing with others. That is, you know, something that we've been very, we, we've talked about this um, really for about a decade of, of this is pre-competitive. This is not a competitive advantage. We don't see it that way. Um, you know, we're proud that we're leaders in space. Don't get me wrong. You know, we want to do our, our thing, but um, the more and the, the more folks in the cocoa ecosystem who are participating and have eyes on this and are working on it, the faster we're going to get to the solutions that I think we're all looking for. Brilliant. I, I wasn't expecting anything less, but but Coco, Coco's had, I mean, chocolate has had a history of having some brands and we have a Dutch brand, I'm not going to name that brand, but also a few few English, British brands and what have you that, that very early sort of had slave free chocolate and what have you as yeah. rebranding. Uh, but I, I'm glad to hear, I, I, and I personally, I agree with you, Lee, that I think we need to pull everyone along the line. But it's a good question, and I've seen it raised before, and I think we're, all of us as universal investors, owning all the retailers, having investments in all the retailers, hotels, where, wherever you see all these white label chocolates popping up, and there's a huge amount of chocolates coming in, in all kinds of different industries when you, when you start looking at it. Uh, I think there's something there to pull them all in. So we share that cost of developing this level playing field as well. So, yeah. so I think if I could just add one additional thing. And I also think, and, and you know, we've, we've talked about this as part of WCF for a very long time of, you know, each of us in this space, whether we're branded or processors, you know, we have unique capabilities and we have unique strengths. And if we could, you know, kind of pull together all of those as opposed to the duplication sometimes that I have felt in the past. Right, so a lot of us are doing the same types of things. Uh, so for us, it's hey, you know, how does everyone bring their capabilities, the expertise, the things that we can really make a difference on, and really uh, get at it more holistically? Is something that I think uh, Hershey has always had uh, a keen eye on. So that's the you know to to just build on the point that you made. Yeah, no, but I think that's and I I think that's great to hear because I think. Typically, and what we've addressed on this call is when we start an engagement with the sector, there's there's some sort of not infighting, but people are a bit cautious on on giving away stuff. But but when you get going and you see that the issue is a collective issue and we're stronger together, which I think is the case with with the cocoa industry right now, I I think you get that efficiency, and I think we as investors can drive that 
collectively as well. Yeah. So, so there's some good points there. We're getting more questions coming in from from the audience. I think that's I think that's a great point. So, so it, this is to you, Stina. Could you point uh, to any current analysis or identify particular gaps of business and procurement models and supply chain value sharing approaches? Ooh, that's a big one, I would say. <laughs> Yeah, I think we can have a whole session yeah, in itself. Choose, on, choose on, one. On that one, yeah. No, um, I, I mean, so I think I think there is some some interesting emerging examples. Um, I would say I know that there is one uh, Swedish retailer, actually food retailer, that that has been working quite a bit on this, and and they do, uh, they they do joint analysis with uh, the sustainability and the procurement. Uh, departments in in that company, so I, I'm sure other companies do that um, too to some extent. But I think they've really put a lot of effort in uh, in doing joint um, training um, on you know what what does sustainability, sustainable procurement actually mean, um, making sure that they are aligned in in that approach, um, and just putting joint targets uh, between the procurement uh, department and um, and um, and the sustainability department, so I think that's that's maybe the the one that that sort of pops up um, immediately in my head, and I think that's yeah that that conversation and that joint target setting and um, and and yeah strategic outlook if you will for for both um, both departments. I think that's that's for for more companies to follow. Anyone on the panel who's got other experiences on this one? No, brilliant. Another question that was raised, uh, it, and we see him as always, I, I get that, that's my experience as well. We get caught, caught in West Africa. Uh, but I would say, uh, and, and I'm, asking, I'm asking my panel here now, but I presume these are the same kind of discussions we see about Latin America as well. Is there any difference right now in the discussion on, on Western Africa and Latin America, would you say, or, or is this the same? Do we have the same kind of discussions for Latin America as well? Any comments? No, there's no comments from. Yes, maybe Dina, I can. I can go. I mean, yeah, yeah. I think. I, I mean, I think definitely some some uh, some issues and well, many issues are reoccurring. Um, of course, then then I mean, they're also also very specific, unique um, issues to any any uh, in the given um, sourcing location, um, and yeah. So I think I mean definitely there um, there there are commonalities um, and things that that we can you know definitely learn um, from each other. I I just also wanted to make some uh, some other points, and that's I think one thing that we haven't touched upon in this panel is also the getting to. Um, well, just adding to to what what was said before on. Um, uh, that that there is, I mean, there is of course a, a joint reputation of risk here for the whole uh, for the whole industry, and therefore I think it it makes so much sense to collaborate and and also, I mean, as as Lee pointed to that you know, uh, it's not a competitive advantage as such for a company, but actually you know to avoid headlines, if you will, and and really, I mean, of course, get to uh, get to the issues and, and really address child labor, everybody needs to, um, to be involved. And I think with that, I also wanted to point to um, the part of the supply chain um, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, for example, that um, uh, that aren't uh, or isn't organized uh, in in cooperatives um so also to strengthen that part where um and and get to the the more remote um farmers uh, as well i think that's also also something that the industry jointly need to uh need to get to um so so i also wanted to just add a little bit more uh more flavor to to that topic as well yeah and maybe um john Steve now, on, on, on Latin America, West Africa, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on all the supply chains, but what we did do uh, as investors is sign on to the Investor Alliance on Human Rights and Business and Human Rights Resource Center uh, investor letter to make sure that the uh, legislation that is coming up is actually including, and Andrew touched upon it, including the rights and the stakeholder voices and the human rights defenders' voices. So 
so that we get more information from the ground, uh, indeed. Um, and maybe my last comment and also a question, maybe to address offline, but talking about what investors can do, right? And we have the engagement, we have investor letters and we have voting. And more and more we see companies coming out um, on AGMs with a, a say on climate, uh, a, a way that we can vote yes or no to climate plans of companies. So I could imagine that in the, in the, in the, in the future, we could also have a say on human rights. Uh, Happy to, to, to discuss at another point, but also curious to know uh, uh, your thoughts about that. Thanks. Excellent. We're getting close to the end of our session here now, and I'm, we've touched upon some, some really good topics that I know very well. Have we missed any topic that we should have addressed? I'm leaving it open to my excellent panelists here. Uh, anything on heart? We haven't really touched upon the impact of climate change on, on this whole discussion. I was going to touch upon that when, when we're, I mean, in, in financial terms, we always want to diversify risk. And I think diversifying back to the Latin America issue, having, having different regional uh, prospects up and running is probably a wise idea with climate change and climate impact coming into the line. But uh, we're getting short on time. Anyone wants to add anything, any topic we've missed? Stina. I can quickly I can quickly add on that because I think I mean the, the cornerstone in that is is so much to you know to, to enable farmers um, again so I just want to get back to that I mean of course you know if if you're expecting farmers to to adapt to you know biodiversity issues to to climate change issues you know they need to be able to invest in their farms of course so you know so that's I think that's just the underlying um, matter here and and we need to you know we need to support um in in that sense um in in any way that uh, that we can in our respective um organizations so i just wanted to come back to that and and of course i mean there is a very clear link there between uh between looking at living income former livelihoods and and looking at the environmental issues that um that the cocoa sector and, and any other sector for that matter also also faces so uh, so that's yeah that's my um, my two cents on that. Maybe I can add to what Stina just said. I mean, what I found very encouraging is this messaging that that uh, the industry is collaborating or is very open to collaborating, is indeed collaborating. And I think what us, as from our side as an investor, we'd like to see is more of that, um, really comparing how Stina said it, what works, what doesn't work uh, the, to empower, to enable farmers. And also perhaps not only within the industry, but also with other industries um, in the agriculture space that are sourcing, that having these issues. We saw a very interesting example from a, from a company using um, using a blockchain based startup to to enable farmers to have their own trading transaction data for example getting ownership over over the transaction data and being bringing much more transparency in the supply chain against resistance of course of these intermediary players and i think that's that these are all very promising developments so um yes please uh, do um further this collaborative approach because i do think it's not possible without uh, a systemic issue Excellent. And I'm going to wrap this up now because I've only got two minutes. I'm getting told here by by the background staff that I need to wrap this. I, th I think it's been brilliant. I, I knew we had some excellent people on this call. And obviously, we're, we've only scratched on the surface, on the interaction to Lee's point. I mean, the ESG movement is huge, not only in the US, but, but in Europe and other parts of the world as well. I hope we're not pestering the companies too much because we want you to, to use your resources to actually have an impact and to work on change. I think personally, my experience is uh, as an asset owner and as a manager, and I, when you start engaging, you, you can't really stop. There's, there's a never ending story. There's so much to touch upon and there's so many things to do. And with climate change and with all the challenges we have ahead of us, and we all want to have uh, fair and and equitable chocolate to eat in a good transparent manner to Tamara's point we will continue this discussion but I find it very encouraging and I find that we we're heading in the right direction so it's been great I really appreciate all of you participating I hope everyone listening in you, it's been uh, good for you guys as well the questions have been really nice so uh, thank you very much for participating and i hope we're doing this right on time as well this time thank you